Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Super Fantify. This has been a show where I talk about TV shows of the supernatural, fantasy, and or science fictional genre. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about I'm a Virgo season finale. Great season finale. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. So immediately, uh... Picking up where the last episode left off, we see Cootie and the team enact their plan. They knock out the uh, regulator and power comes back to the town. And we see different groups of people and circumstances with the lights coming back on. And they're trying to, you know, break up and like, hey, we'll meet back at my place. And we see... We We as the audience finally get to see what the Lost episode looked like. And so um, the Lost episode of uh, Parking Ticket. Because one guard had to be taken out of there and just his eyes are wide open. And he has like a large like tear coming out of his eyes. I mean it's like abnormally large. And the two security guards there end up watching it finally. Because they see the little footprints you know from uh, the... Uh, I forgot their name last episode but this episode... I remembered it between the episodes. It's Death by a Do Thousand Cuts was the uh, lower bottoms now that they're smaller. Like that was their new name. And so you see their footprints as they like went over and like put the, the CD in. But um, yeah, the, the guys play it and watch it. And it's about Justin and his phrase. He said it since he was a baby. The reaction it got to like other people laughing and it kind of made this person, made Justin kind of like the life of the party. And I don't know whether that's supposed to imply. And once again, the episode is called like uh, a metaphor for what? Obviously, it's a line in the episode that. The episode titles, it's just one of those shows where those episode titles typically come from a line in the episode. But part of me wondering is, is Justin's circumstance is supposed to be a metaphor of like, right, you just skated your own entire life. Like, did you only ever know that phrase and it kind of got you through most of your life? Is that just only way you could communicate um, I don't know whether to take that situation so literal or is it, I mean, it feels the whole thing has always been philosophical and metaphorical. So I don't know if I should really take that as such face value of like, hey, maybe he never learned how to say anything else because he never had to say anything else throughout life except for that because that always coasted him throughout every avenue of life. Or maybe it's just supposed to be like, hey, he's having regular conversations, but we're just kind of skipping over that because there was regular dialogue in the show except for like his boy, uh, his, you know, catchphrase and everything like that. And so I, it has to be like metaphorical, just like, right, this is the, uh, I just skated on life by and, you know, I uh, was able to kind of make it through life happily for it up until a certain point. And then you see him kind of like sad and just then the line delivery gets sadder and sadder. Then it's like, oh, I'm a little bit older. And I, I say it again. I'm I'm meeting my few, the person who's going to eventually become my wife. I have a family. And um, it just, it kind of like ebbs and flows. So it's just kind of, I guess, the metaphorical element of just like the ups and downs of life. And then it got really like trippy and you saw and heard the catchphrase like from different points of life kind of getting thrown at you. And um, eventually you see Justin's death and his grave and how extensive the tombstone is going all the way into the ground down to the casket. But saying like the full phrase over and over and over and over and over and over again. But it's not even saying it over and over again. It's just keeping it going. Like, boy, yo, 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 yo. I mean, it's really interesting considering, like, right, Justin was always thrown into the show for, like, the catchphrase, boy, yo, 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 and that, that was the whole point, right? But this is the first time in the entire episode was kind of de um, devoted to him and um, getting his perspective and situational things i wonder is it on some level supposed to be almost like this connective thread of like play like the metaphor and philosophical elements of every other episode we've gotten over the course of the show was this supposed to be kind of like a culmination in so many different regards because not only was it the lost episode it almost feels like it's a series finale of the show considering so it makes you wonder like was the cause we only know that as the lost episode we don't know where it falls in the wow. season but with the justin circumstances being what they are you'd assume it was like the final episode maybe but uh, maybe it feels like it's supposed to be a culmination of just every like parking tickets episode and bit we've gotten over the course of the show kind of culminating in all of this and culminating in Justin's story. Like I said, the beginning of his story to the end of his story. And, you know, like I said, that phrase that was kind of meant to be like a jokey punchline being the only like 95% of the lines in the episode. 
And for that, I mean, because that's that's also goes back to my point about like whether it's like to be taken at face value, because even the uh, priest giving the uh, eulogy at the end, not I guess we had eulogy like to, you know, uh, after Justin was like buried, was staying like because um, was saying boy, 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 too. So it was like, I don't like I said, I don't know what, what that's supposed to mean of just like it's so integrated in that world now that everyone kind of talks like that. I don't know if that's supposed to be. There's just, I'm sure there's a lot of deeper layers to that that I'm probably not really quite capturing or getting, but uh, back to uh, the real world outside of that cartoon. I mean, obviously, uh, outside of the effect it had on those guards, because even they started um, tearing up for him, and like, you know, it's just like, and what I thought the point was like, oh, you're going to laugh so hard it hits you, but, you know, I don't know if that's supposed to be indicative of they were affected differently than everyone else, like, because the other guy seemed like he was smiling, but it's supposed to seem like it's supposed to be so good and so funny that you would kind of, like, get exhausted and, like, basically end up in your situation because you were laughing so hard. And once again, it's supposed to be, like, 93 point some percent of the viewership had that effect. So I'm wondering, are they supposed to be that other 6 to 7 percent, or are they still in that category of, like, their response to it is within that 93, it's the exact thing that's supposed to happen to the 93 percent, 93 point some percent. Either way, um, it seems like the mission was a great success, but the problem uh, is that it turned out it didn't last forever because the uh, power company just brought in like more regulators. So it's like, right, you did one thing, but they immediately fixed it. So it's like, it was almost like, was it all worth it? It was kind of meant for nothing because, you know, they're celebrating everything. I even love... Uh, uh, Martise doing his song and it's just he made a metaphor to kind of dropping panties or whatever and uh uh LaFrancine's like why are you why would you even do that he's like it's supposed to be a metaphor it's like a metaphor for what he's like um panties and revolution and he made another comparison to him Felix is looking around like what the what what are you talking about dude so but the celebrations are kind of cut short when like Felix is kind of calling out well, he's pissed because the lower um, bottoms ended up destroying his car. I guess they were kind of acting as maybe the getaway drivers, like, hey, like, follow the car. Because we did see a car, blue car that was smashed up. I was like, is that supposed to be Felix's? I'm like, no, it can't be, right? No, it was the lower uh, bottoms. They, uh, death by a thousand cuts, they ended up um, smashing up the car, uh, trying to, I guess, lure the cops away so they won't know where to follow them back to Cootie's place. But, um,. But obviously Felix blames him more so than anything. It's like, right, this is your hair brained idea. You did all of this because of ego, not trying to actually help people. But he's like, no, I don't have any ego in this. And Flora's like, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think he's right, but I don't agree. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like either you like, and it kind of went to this back and forth between them about like the definition of like, well, obviously you're supposed to not agree. Like you're supposed to completely disagree because I don't have an ego in this. Then he had the posters and everything that they were going to put up. But sadly, they got found out because the hero shows up. It's like, well, of course, they're going to find you out because you are the only giant in Oakland. So it was pretty quickly to find out. Easy to find out, hey, you're responsible for what happened, you know? I mean, you literally made posters about, like, oh, like, what we did, and it's, like, two smaller people and, like, you. Like, so it's, you know, even if you've got mask on, it's not going to be that hard to figure out. You're not that conspicuous. And they're making this whole point about, hey, uh, we have these weapons for you, but it's like, no, the, the, the weapons aid gave... Uh, Cootie to use against the regulator. He's like, they broke after two or three hits. Even saying like, yo, this device is made from like an old phone and stuff like that. It's like the stuff Martise put together is kind of crap. Like who's to guarantee even say like any of it works. And even if it does, it's probably going to be a one-off thing. Like, oh, this gun they made, like Martise is trying to hand it to him. It's like, you know, none of the stuff you've made is good. Like you guys have been like, 20 years planning this and like you've lied to me and it was kind of awful because you're stumbling through this just as much as I am because it's, it's also to that it also plays into that point of once again once you get older you kind of start to realize like oh wow my parents don't know everything you realize how much they've told you the truth about how much they've lied to you and he had to call his parents out and say right we lied to you because this is what was necessary to get you to this point so yeah you might not agree with all of it but it's like because for him, it's now he's questioning everything. It's like, I should have listened to Jones because she's a real leader in this type of thing. You guys are just stumbling in the dark throughout all of this. So 
Felix, along with the lower uh, bottoms, as well as uh, Flora, end up escaping. And Cootie ends up going to go see Jones. Um, when it comes to Jones, though, what I thought was kind of interesting is she was in the middle of a conversation with someone about, like, she's like, oh, I just want to know that you're thinking about me. And then Jones is power her thing is about to activate and she's like no 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 and I was like oh did you stop her from doing it was she doing that consciously or subconsciously was she about to do her her thing as Cootie kind of refers to it as so I was like interesting because obviously we've only seen that pop up episode four so we don't really have an understanding of what Jones's circumstances are obviously we spend enough with Flora and we even got the backstory to kind of give us insight into her ability and everything but uh, Cootie shows up and, you know, Jones talks about like, right, what you want to do isn't a long enough solution. It's like what we're doing here, that is going to be one. But, you know, the hero shows up trying to attack Cootie. Luckily, La Francine comes out of nowhere, hits the hero of a car and just because that's the last time we see her in the episode. Uh, the scene back at the house is the last time we saw Martise in the episode. But. Cootie tries to run into the building with the Colt because they're like, hey, come in here. They proceeded to lock him in up an almost almost a, a version of like an Iron Maiden, almost. But uh, the plan was to cut out his eye because it's like, oh, great phenom, like uh, poly, uh, poly made. Like, if we cut out your eye, wisdom and uh, virility will be bestowed upon us. He broke out. I even love the lady who shot him with the arrow being like, sorry, great feeling a... Um, Then he ends up tussling with the hero, which quickly kind of disposes of him. And it's like this whole thing of, I love it. It's like, oh, you're coming with me. Just shut up and smacking him. I was like, I don't think you're going to kill him, but what are you going to do? And it's like, right, that shoe was on the other foot now. And now it's a situation of, he's like, all right. He's like, Cootie. He's like, don't call me Cootie. Call me Thug One. He's like, okay, Thug One, fine. He's like, nah, it doesn't sound nice when you say, all right, call me Cootie. You can call me Cootie. He's like, I... I tried calling you Cootie, but then you told me to call you Thug One. Okay, fine. He's like, we're, we're back to the Cootie thing. And he tries to talk to him. It's like, right. Both of us can be the ones to change the world. You know, I've, I've been trying to handle this whole situation on one, but it takes two of us. And he shows the billboards of like, hey, the billboard of the hero saying like, basically, uh, get your mind right type of situation. And then there's the one of po uh, Cootie, uh, you know, um, because it's like basically about the undies modeling he did. And it's like, oh, you don't need, sometimes you might not even need one or something like that. Which I don't know if that's, that felt like a, unintentional, that particular, those two particular phrasings for those like billboards. But also what's kind of going on between both of them right now. And so he was able to kind of convince Cootie like, right, let's work together. We can do so much good. But obviously he was just buying time. Especially when Cootie was like, all right, I have one question for you. And ask him about this thing in the comic book. He's like, hey, I thought he was genuinely going to be like, wow, you're the only person that asked me about that. He's like, I leave little clues in my comics. Sometimes they lead nowhere other times. And he proceeded to sneak attack Cootie. Chained him up. First and foremost, the way that scene was playing, I was like, hey, you don't like that? That imagery uh, is the last thing you want people to see. Well, you had the rope wrapped around his neck. It's like, that's, you know, you know black man with a rope around his neck. Not a good sign. But then you chain him up and I'm like, not like that makes that any better. And he proceeds to bludgeon and beat on Cootie when Cootie's like defenseless. Because he tried to justify like, hey, I needed a super villain. You weren't a bad guy. I just needed a super villain so that people would believe in me more again and just kind of also be on my side and see that my way of thinking is the right way. And luckily, Joan showed up and Cootie's like, no, you have to do your thing. And she does. She convinces him. It's like, right, you, you want to seem reasonable and that you're right and want to prove your point? Then listen to what I have to say. And Jones activates her ability. Like, I don't know if she actively always uses it, but I think, like, it pops in from, from time to time. Um, but I think it's so fascinating that the, the journey she took in one of, like, um, it was it was real, insightful, interesting perspective on things. It's also, um, there's a little bit of funny and humor, humor humorous elements to it. Once again, it's just, like, once again, it kind of, coincides with like like I said the theme of the show in general and then you add in like the parking tickets of all like how they do that same thing as well but for her it's like this capitalistic situation kind of benefits from unemployment being kind of in, in a good place 
uh, because it's like it needs an army of unemployed because he was trying to make the whole point of like, right, like, you know, she talks about like the, the illegality that people have to go through when it comes to unemployment and stuff like that. And he's like, oh, you're leaving out like murder and violence and stuff like that. But then she brings up the point of this system kind of feeds off of and actually it's a necessity for violence because both legal and illegally, there is always going to be angles that lead to violence. It's like. Right, like you like try and gather stuff in a store and you run out, there's going to be some like security guard or somebody on the side of the law who's going to physically stop you if they have to type of situation. So like saying that every facet of this on the legal side or the illegal side of things can turn to a, a physical situation because it's like, hey, oh, you have the deed to this building. Like say someone wants to bulldoze your building and wants to put up something in place. It's like, right, you have this deed. It's like, well, that deed is a contract that says, like, if they try to do that, police will, sh men with guns will show up to defend it. Those are police, but not, you know, uh, anyone dead with an illegal business doesn't have that, hey, I can't go through the court route, so I use violence to make my point across because I can't legally be like, oh, this area should only have two coke dealers. It's kind of like the point she was making. Once again, I just love that whole sequence and just like, like I said, the, the journey that Jones was taking him on, but also the manner in which the, the scenes transitioned and stuff like that. Um, breaking down the whole situation of like, right, you go back into a certain point in the 1900s when alcohol was illegal, you still alcohol, you end up getting gangsters coming after you, which I love that whole sequence. She's like, go. Go, motherfucker, go. And she's like, yeah, motherfuckers. And uh, I also appreciate those sequences, too, where it's like cooties just at some point in the scene sometimes uh, taking part in it. But um, And then it's like, oh, when alcohol became legal, you steal from a liquor store, the police come to get you. It's like, oh, when weed wasn't legal, gangsters would come after you when you steal. And I love that she's like, get on the ground now. And then when they steal the weed, now that weed's legal, she's like, um, pretty please, can you all get on the ground and stuff? It's like, yeah. And then the hero gets on the ground. She's like, no, not you. Get up. I was like, I, I love the fun that they kind of had with that. But it's like, yeah, afterwards, the police come and get you. So... Kind of talking about this complicated cycle that is the capital capitalism and its need to keep you down and unemployed because it all because violence, like I said, is a necessity across the board. And basically, she was making the point of like, how do you tell people like this kind of negative side of capitalism for them to kind of throw it aside? It's like, well. You don't. You kind of make them see the way, and I'm going to butcher the whole point she was making. Like that's the problem. Is like I think because some of it goes above my head, and some of it I feel like I'm getting, but I also feel like I'm misinterpreting some of it. But so I am going to get some wrong stuff wrong in my interpretation of it. But like the fact is that she was basically making this point of. Um, basically you point someone else out as the enemy. You, you make it seem like, oh, this other culture or whatever is the problem. And that's how you keep things in this, this lane and keep people, the working class in particular, like looking at someone else as the enemy rather than like the, the larger issue and, you know, why, how the capitalism situation keeps, you know, how it all feeds into itself. It is this kind of almost self-producing, self-eating beast that it is. Like, I'm going to butcher it, but she was making this point of how obviously he was kind of being a part of the, the, the issue himself as a superhero. And it's like, you're not fixing the situation like you think you are. You're, you're playing your own role in perpetuating this whole system and its necessity for violence. And it did, at the end of the day, when it was all some all said and done, when Jones was done, it made him just kind of turn and walk away. Like, she kind of broadened his horizon. She kind of opened his mind. Kind of, I guess, almost like I opened his third eye type of situation. And I talked about this before, especially in the first episode, how he had talked about things in such binary means of like, oh, um... Maybe binary isn't the right word. Well, maybe. Where he just saw... He equated things so easily as just black and white and no shades of gray. When there is just... Once again, there's so much com more complexity in that. And you, you narrow your view on things when you just look at things in black and white. And not really able to see the deeper levels that things... The gray, the context. That all does matter. So... But it, it worked. And uh, ultimately, the uh, hero left. So they were able to kind of 
stop him like I don't know if that's going to be a permanent thing and what that means going forward for his journey like does that mean he's going to reevaluate everything because his entire foundation of his system his very foundation of who he is he's defined himself as this for so long that was kind of cracked open and Jones is like how did you even know that was going to work he's like and because I'm it cuts to the title of like I'm a Virgo so But then we get that strange ending where we finally go back to Cootie's skin and the skin like is like scarred up and pussy even more and it starts splitting open and there's like green stuff on them. I'm like, are you a damn lizard or like what? Like I was like, wait, was I right about the alien thing beforehand? Once again, it's like we're so, so much we don't know about Cootie's circumstances because we don't know about his birth and his biological mom. Um, the sh at the time we recorded this, the show hasn't been renewed for a second season yet. To be fair, it's only been out for a couple days at the time we're recording this. So obviously very rarely do like any network or situation um, get uh make those decisions that quickly um but now it begs the question like well if there is going to be a season two if we get a season two where will this take us like with cootie's circumstances because there's still so much more to explore there is a whole scat thing i haven't really talked about that even though he's kind of like i i've, I've forgotten to talk about it for it's because it's been a part of the episodes for the past i think two or three episodes because he's also in this episode a little bit at the end when all of them are there at the end watching the hero fly away that he's kind of by their side and I don't know if it's a thing of I'm 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 still with you in spirit or is it supposed to be a thing of it feels like some of the times it's like when things were kind of going bad amongst everyone that's when he'd be there just kind of almost like watching and it's just I guess it almost parallels with him like watching the show and kind of getting sucked in like he was in episode three I think so I don't know But what Cootie's actual circumstances are, what happens to everyone beyond this, because not everything's been resolved. The lower bottom are still shrunk, so how do you reverse that? Once again, like, they kind of alluded to, like, who might be behind this, but we never got a resolution to that. Um... Like I said, what happens to the hero going forward as he completely changes mind? Does someone else step up to fill that void? Like what ends up happening like all across the board? Like, hey, will everything car has been up to, will it all work out in the end? Um, it's going to be a slow and long process, but it is happening and it is working and it, it does matter. So stuff like that. What are the characters would we get introduced to later on with their, their own kind of, I guess, I'm not well versed in it. I was about to say My Hero Academia. I know enough, like, enough, like, outside tidbits information to know, like, right, their powers and their abilities are known as quirks. So I was about to say, like, oh, what other abilities slash quirks would, you know, other characters appear in the future to have? And, you know, would you, would you get more parking ticket stuff, even though you, you saw the lost episode? But once again, maybe it's the lost episode, but maybe it's not. I, I kind of labeled it as, oh, even though it's a lost episode, maybe it's kind of like a series finale, but maybe it's not. So qu questions like that. Um, it'd be so interesting to find out where everything would go going for Because I, I don't think I've seen anything necessarily saying that this is a one-off. I think... Um, there's potential for more if given the opportunity. We'll have to wait. Like I said, I didn't see anything that did definitively said like this was supposed to be like a one and done. So where things could go from here is kind of almost like the sky's the limit with just how wild this show is on so many levels. So I, I'd love to see where a se uh, season two would take us with all of this. Uh, but really, that's all I wanted to talk about. To the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and good night.